Hi there, this is Mushtaba Ahmad and you are watching my O-Levels lecture series on biology. Uh, the syllabus code is 5090 and this is the sixth lecture in this series and we are going to continue with the, the basics of classification and this lecture will build upon uh, the previously recorded lecture that has been uploaded as well. Um, and that relates to classification obviously. Um, so, the first two questions uh, I discussed them in the last lecture as well. So, classification does it really matter and naming living organisms in a standard manner in where we discussed uh, and talked about the, uh, the naming system, the binomial name nomenclature that was fathered by Carl Linnaeus. So, now today we are going to take a look at the five kingdoms. Um, uh, furthermore, we are going to be um, discussing the the two groups of living organisms in which they are broadly divided the vertebrates and the invertebrates or the arthropods um, but also um, we are going to uh, be talking so so all in all we are going to be talking something that relates to what you see on your screen right now on the right side um, that's an example how um, uh, how a living organism is arranged in an in a hierarchical manner in biology so so it's uh, the, the so the example is of uh, us humans so we are homo sapiens and homo is our genus and sapiens are specific epithet so the sp the that's the species level then genus is homo family uh, we are from hominids then ordered primates class mammals uh, phylum our phylum is chordates and the kingdom from which we belong to or to which we belong to sorry is uh, animals so kingdom animalia is uh, our kingdom um, but we are not going to really discuss each and every part of what you see on the, the on this image um, rather this is just an example to illustrate or stress stress upon the upon the the arrangement or or arrangement in a hierarchical manner of uh, living organism so first the species and genus family order class phylum and then kingdom so every living organism uh, would have such sort of uh, divisions as well so it would have a family order class phylum um, then kingdom as well and so without further uh, ado i'll move on to my next slide which talks about the learning outcomes and we, as always we are going to see what cambridge has published officially uh, for the candidates to know so we are going to learn the main features used to place all organisms into one of the five kingdoms so five kingdoms are what we are going to be mostly discussing in this lecture the kingdom animal uh, plant fungus prokaryote and proctist protoctist then we will be discussing the main features as well we are uh, we will take up the features that are used to place the organism into two broad groups uh, of animal kingdom which is limited to the first group which is vertebrates which includes mammals birds reptiles amphibians fish and then the invertebrates or the arthropods which includes mostly the but, but rather the, the all sorts of insects so to say in, in general language so the, they are divided into my reports uh, insects arachnids and then crustaceans and then we will be uh, discussing also um, the plant kingdom and that would be limited to the ferns and the flowering plants both the dicotyledonous and monocotyledonous so we are going to just uh, briefly discuss the dicots and the monocots as well then we will be uh, so after learning these points you will be able to classify the organisms uh, according to the features that you will learn in the previous uh, bullet points so that is the main idea of this bullet point then we will be uh, uh, learning a little bit about virology the study of viruses uh, in biology and we will be limiting ourselves to the protein code and genetic material so we will be seeing its structure um, and then discussing uh, its properties or how it, differ it is different from uh, other living organisms and uh, so this this is a continuation of the, the previous point and the, the strand that oh, they only replicate in living cells then that we will be taking up as well and we will be discussing. So, so the first off uh, the first kingdom that we are going to see is kingdom Monera or Procreot but um, guys on the top right side uh, top right corner of your screen what you see is a moving picture or a GIF image uh -huh, that I thought would be an interesting one to add onto my slide is uh, of a paramecium 
which belongs to kingdom protista that we are going to be discussing in a while it's found in mostly fresh water or stagnant water basins as well and it's observed to be a um, moving uh, living organism it, it's really motile and it's uh, seen as seen under a microscope it's seen as a motile living organism and it's a unicellular eukaryotic uh, organism which is classed as a protista so first off start let's start with the kingdom uh, prokaryote or monera so it's the kingdom monera is also known as the kingdom prokaryote because most of the times the living organisms that are classed in this kingdom are prokaryotic and the prokaryotic uh, living organisms have, have do not have a well defined nucleus and they also lack cell organelles uh, they, the 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 living organisms that are put into this or uh, this uh, kingdom uh, as the name suggests are prokaryotic and they are also unicellular it's important to note that they are not multicellular rather unicellular organisms and prokaryotic which do not have a well defined nucleus um some uh, organisms have the presence of cell wall as well um while others lack it so therefore we can say that living organisms grouped into this kingdom can be both autotrophic uh, in in case of plants for example they, because they have cell walls and while on the other hand heterotrophic organisms are also classed into this kingdom uh, which is kingdom monera or prokaryote so uh, i've also added examples that include bacteria cyanobacteria which is also a blue green sort of bacteria and then mycoplasma mycoplasma so that's uh, what you need to learn about uh, and this will uh, remain the same uh, for the rest of the four kingdoms we'll be discussing their properties examples and discussing the main features that need to be uh, known as well or learned as well so the second kingdom is kingdom protista and they the organisms which are all unicellular but they are eukaryotic organisms so in the previous kingdom which was kingdom monera they were the, the organisms were unicellular but they were also pro they were only prokaryotic that is they lacked a proper cell uh, cell wall or sorry proper cell um, nucleus but the kingdom protista has Uh, organisms which are unicellular and they are eukaryotic in nature as well um th- these uh, this kingdom includes uh, the simplest forms of eukaryotes so uh, so it is important to understand that the simplest forms of eukaryotes uh, that exhibit that exhibit both autotrophic or um, heterotrophic mode of nutrition as well so autotrophic in case of plants um and then um or other microorganisms as well because th- not only plants are unicell- unicellular or there are many microorganisms that can make the, up their own food so they are also classed into this uh, kingdom some organisms have appendages for example as uh, for uh, such as cilia or flagella so appendages definitely uh, these are the structures or protrusions you can say that enable a living organism to protrude or to move um to move in a medium uh, so cilia flagella or zoopodia are such appendages which allow it to move around so motility is provided by these uh, appendages some examples are diatoms uh, protozoans like amoeba or paramecium so these so, so this this very example what i have uh, what i am showing you on the screen is uh, a motile paramecium and it is able to move because of its structure it has a shoe sole like uh, structure and it's seen uh, as a moving body in water when uh, when analyzed through a microscope so it is important that you understand uh, or the these or the organisms which are autotrophic uh, and heterotrophic and unicellular but simplest form of eukaryotes are classed into kingdom protista and some of, of the organisms that show motility by the virtue of uh, appendages are also classed in kingdom protista the third kingdom that we are going to be discussing is um kingdom fungi and these are also you these are also uh, eukaryotes uh, but they are uh, heterotrophic and multicellular as well so they are group, grouped into kingdom fungi um their mode of nutrition is separate sep- sorry guys 
the mode of nutrition is saprophytic that means they are saprophytes so, the, so they use decaying organic matter as food so it's important that they you understand that they cannot synthesize their own food rather they are the decomposers in nature so they play an, an extremely important role because they are the decomposers the natural decomposers of our, of our earth of our planet and they help digest or break down the the complex biological molecules sugars into simpler ones so that they can be um, recycled and utilized later back um, that that relates to the various cycles such as nitrogen nitrogen cycle as well um, but then they have cell walls as well uh, which are made up of a substance called chitin so it is important that you understand they are also made up of cell walls up till now we have discussed that only plants have cell walls but fungi uh, seem uh, turns out that fungi also have their own cell walls but they are made up of a substance called chitin so in case uh, an organism has a cell wall and it's made up of a chitin then you must be able to identify that it's uh, a f- an example of a fungus or, or or belongs to kingdom fungi and uh, then fungi are all also some so fungi also form symbiotic association with some blue green algae it's important that you understand symbiotic form of association it means that one organism most of the times the both organism from different species uh, they benefit um, they benefit each other in case um, and then so the host benefits its um, the other living organism that survives on it and in um the the both form a symbiotic association uh, in that case the 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 form symbiosis they the follow symbiosis and then yeast mushroom aspergillus are examples of fungi so these are the three examples that are the most common ones in the in in case of fungi then uh the 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 second kingdom on this slide is kingdom plantae Uh, and these are eukaryotic multicellular organisms with a cell wall that is made up of cellulose so this is the differentiating characteristic of plant cell wall and the, f- the cell wall of a fungus they are autotrophs means that they synthesize their own food through the process of photosynthesis and this kingdom includes all plants all sorts of plants be it simpler plants or complex vascular tissues uh, containing plants they are classed in uh, kingdom plantae and the characteristics of these of of sorry of this kingdom is that they are eukaryotic eukaryotic a uh, multicellular and the cellulose is a cell wall component and they are also importantly autotrophs that synthesize their own food through the process of photosynthesis which uh, initiates uh, with the sunlight then based on the body uh, differentiation and presence or absence of specialized vascular tissue kingdom plantae is divided into different divisions namely thylophyta bryophyta petriophyta gymnosperms and angiosperms and examples are spirogyra ferns pines and mango plants plants so gymnos gymnosperms and angiosperms are the two uh, most popular most of the popular the two popular ones uh in kingdom plantae and we are going to take uh, take both of these up uh, in a coming slides as well and we will be discussing gymnosperms and angiosperms their characteristics as well so the last kingdom uh, which is the the most um, i say diverse one is the kingdom plant kingdom sorry kingdom animalia and it includes first of all it includes human beings as well uh, and it is sorry it includes a uh, multicellular eukaryotic Uh, organisms that lack cell wall so they uh, all of the animals uh, they ha- they are, they adopt heterotrophic mode of nutrition that is they cannot exi- uh, sorry they they cannot uh, synthesize their own food food on their own so they are uh, con- the consumers they are not the producers so some organisms are simple while others have a complex body with specialized tissue differentiation and body organs so animals have really really complex and evolutionarily um evolutionarily um what we can say complex or 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 really diverse so, sort of uh, uh, sort of organs or structures that are well adapted to their uh, body evolutionarily it is conserved so the animal kingdom is mainly divided into many phyla and classes as i showed you on the on the first slide as well that in the kingdoms 
um, uh, phyla many many organisms are divided into different phyla and the classes um, some examples include uh, sorry some examples include hydra starfish uh, monkeys earthworms birds human beings so homo so to say homo sapiens this is an example of a starfish that you see and it often um, is observed to glow under uh, sea water now we are going to before moving on to discussing the vertebrates or and the invertebrates we are going to take a look at uh, the concepts of cold blooded animals because we are going to be seeing these uh, really commonly and the warm blooded animals so cold blooded animals are the animals that are not capable capable of regulating their own body's temperature so to say they are not they do not have um, have mechanisms or mechanistic adaptations to regulate their body's function uh, so, sorry their body's temperature rather it's um, it's more more like a fixed sort of temperature of their bodies um, and they, they, therefore they cannot change their or regulate their body temperature in, in case of changing environments on the other hand warm blooded animals are animals which have the ability to maintain nearly constant body temperature irrespective of the temperature of the environment so what it means is is that there is an idea of homeostasis in which uh, a living organism is able to regulate or maintain its uh, temperature by making slight fluctuations or bodily changes within its body to cope up with the changing or fluctuating environmental uh, temperature so we are cold uh, sorry we are warm blooded um, organisms or mammals we are by we i mean humans uh, and we are uh, well adapted to this uh, mechanism that we can develop uh, that we can maintain our body temperature in in case of changing environmental temperatures as well um now we'll be seeing the 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 main groups of uh, vertebrates um the first one is the most important or the most common one which is the mammals um and so guys uh, let me uh, let me tell you that um in the coming slides we'll be following a similar sort of pattern uh, i'll be li i have listed these uh, features and and um, the most important ones are definitely uh, highlighted in green color so you must be able to understand these features so um, for an organism so the, the rationale behind this concept is that for an organism to be enlisted into a particular group so for example now we are discussing mammals so for an organism to be classed as a mammal it has to have these features similarly we'll be discussing what um, other features uh for example an amphibian has to have and then we'll be um, so you you must be able to understand that uh, if you are given an an unknown organism then what and told that it has such or so and so features um then you must be able to identify that to which class of uh, vertebrates or invertebrates it belongs to and you will be able to do this by remembering the features that i'm going to teach you or we are going to discuss together right now so they are covered with hair or fur they are warm blooded that means that they are able to control their internal body temperature in in, in with regards to external conditions uh, constantly with regards of external conditions so so they are able to maintain their internal temperature they are not changed by the uh, by the by the uh, by the external they are not much influenced by the external conditions they rather their body's temperature inner temperature is maintained um, at constant level so the concept of homeostasis in which the body is able to 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 adapt to the external conditions so they are usually born alive and relatively well adapted having grown inside the mother's body in a specialized organ so it's the uterus there where um where a mammal grows inside the womb of a mother the of womb of the mother after birth the young are fed with milk and that is produced by the mammary glands so every mammal has these glands the female one sorry the female mam mammals have these mammary glands to to for lactation or to produce milk for the new ones new newborns and uh, they have larger and more complex brains that the than any other group of animals so evolutionarily we um, the mammals have a more complex um, mode of brain functioning and other structures as well 
um, the, the birds are another group of living organism that that come under vertebrates and they, they have uh, they are warm blooded and they have two legs and they lay eggs adaptations for flight include lightweight skeleton and flexible neck bones as is visible in this uh, little uh, moving picture I, I like to um, add such sort of engaging graphic arts graphics are to to make this the tutorial or the, the lecture more interesting so these are the birds that are flying over the sea or or, or, or a mass of water and they are really lightweight um, and their the body is perfectly adapted for the structure uh, reptiles are vertebrates they have backbones so that therefore they are classed as um, vertebrates uh, their bodies are completely covered with scales they are cold blooded um, and reptiles produce shelled eggs or bear live young so they all they, they can uh, also produce eggs or they can give birth to uh, live uh, newborns or young ones all species flag fertilize eggs internally so there is there are two sorts of uh, fertilization modes of fertilization external fertilization is where uh, female lays an eggs and then the male uh, also also um, lays or what we can say uh, leaves the, the sperm to fertilize um, but on the other hand in, in internal fertilization this complete process of procedure of fertilization takes place within the female's body where, um, where um, a male mates with a female and a sperm fuses with the egg all species of reptiles have at least one lung so they also have um, at least one lung they can be more than one as well that means um, and amphibians are also vertebrates their skin is smooth and slimy amphibians breathe through the skin as well as their lungs in some cases and they are also cold blooded and they have complex life cycle for example larval and adult adult stage stages these are very common life cycles in in, in biology um, and many species of amphibians vocalize one example is the cue the chorus frog so we, uh, we we know that the frogs really make sound especially in the winters or in, in nights or near nearby ponds where they are mostly found the frogs uh, some species fertilize eggs externally some internally so in, in case of amphibians uh, both external and as well as internal fertilization is present which is peculiar to amphibians because uh, previously we saw that reptiles do not uh, fertilize externally um, fish are all cold blooded the, the habitat is water they need grills to breathe they have swim bladders and then fins for movement so these all points must be kept in mind so that, that's why I made them highlighted them uh, in green color because they are really straightforward and important ones so you need to keep in mind these points for each or and every uh, group of vertebrates uh, because in exam you can be asked a question uh, so for instance you can be asked that there is an there is a, an unknown organism or a newly identified organism it's a vertebrate and then they can ask you that it has a smooth and slimy skin it um, is a cold blooded and it's able to vocalize and you must be able to identify it correctly uh, as an amphibian as uh, belonging from a class from the class of amphibians because uh, it exactly matches the features of an amphibian um, now we'll move on to the invertebrates or the main groups of arthropods that you are responsible to understand and then similarly we are going to be uh, discussing the or reading out the, these um, features that that are you are required to understand so they have many pairs of legs if so the first point is that they uh, have many pairs of legs it's not defined the number is not defined do body sections uh, mainly head and then trunk one pair of antenna on head they have simple eyes mandibles which is the lower jaw and maxillae that is the upper jaw and, and it has a respiratory exchange through tracheal system so it also have tracheal system as well so the respiration occurs through proper channels that's the tracheal system um, the second group is insects and uh, which have hard outer skeleton which is called as exoskeleton and it sets three body part head and the thorax uh, and the abdomen uh, it has six legs it has antenna on its head um, so antenna one antenna 
and then most have two pairs of wings not all insects can fly this is important to understand that um, not every insect is able to fly arachnids these have four pairs of legs that means eight in total they uh, they also have two additional pairs of appendages so so appendages as i told you they help in movement as well but the first one serves as feeding and and defense the next pair pedi pedi palps help the organism feed move and reproduce so um, the appendages of arachnids serve two purposes the first uh, pair serves for which is calissary i guess it's pronounced that way it serves in feeding and defense um and the second pair uh, seems to help it uh, feed itself move uh, and reproduce um arachnids do not have antenna or wings uh, and the body is organized into cephalothorax a fusion of the head and thorax and the abdomen so two parts compose its uh, its body uh, first part is cephalothorax the second part is its abdomen to adapt to la to living on land arachnids have internal breathing systems like a trachea or a book lung so it also have a tracheal system um and a lung or a lung system similar to a long lung system um arachnids are mostly carnivorous they feed on predigested body of insects and other small animals so really they are dangerous ones i guess i guess uh, several several groups are venomous even more dangerous <laughs> they they, really, they release the venom from specialized glands to kill prey or any anim enemy so uh they, they seem to have uh, really seem to me to be really um dangerous organisms after all they have uh, uh, uh venomous uh, glands uh, similar to ones found in a snake several mites are parasitic some of those are carriers of disease as well so they are in fact dangerous because they can also um, carry disease uh, which is really an alarming thing for us arachnids usually lay eggs um, which hatch into immature arachnids that are um, that are similar to adults scorpions however give birth to live young so they also usually lay eggs um, um to to give rise to newborns a crustacean is a seg so it has a hard uh, hard uh, exterior which is which i also told you known as um exoskeleton exo means outside towards the outer jointed limbs uh, each um, one have with, with two branches um, termed biremos biremos so two me by means two remos i guess it's for branches so two branches it has jointed limbs um, and then two pairs of antenna are present and then it has gills to breathe then seven or more uh, pairs of appendages for feeding swimming walking respiration and reproduction so i guess appendages is uh m the most important i guess uh, structure of a crustacean because virtually it uh, serves for many purposes for quintessential life pro pro purposes for example feeding swimming walking respiration reproduction clasping sperm transfer egg brooding and carrying young so everything is done by the presence of these appendages so it's important that you understand the 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 role of appendages in the body of a crustacean um now we move on to uh, the divisions of um, kingdom plantae which in which we'll be discussing the uh, the non flowering plants and the flowering plants so to say the gymnosperms and the angiosperms so so, so on the planet earth it turns out that the very first plants to to be observed are to be observed are the the non flowering plants which were relatively simpler i guess or relatively well adapted to the environment therefore they have been there for millions of years um uh i guess uh, it was because of the this their 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 adaptation and their structure adaptation to the environment that's why obviously that's why um, a living organism stays and passes on its um or on its dna or genetic material so uh, they have been there for a while and and flowering plants uh, have uh, have also been there for a while but they have come um, 
after non-flowering ones because of certain reasons and we are going to see how uh, a structure of a non-flowering plant differs to um, in comparison to that of a, of a flowering plant. So beginning uh, starting off with the non-flowering plants, non-flowering plants are simpler than, flower, uh, than flowering plants. So this is very straightforward, very really straightforward po point. Um, they have a higher level of adapt adaptability to the environment. That's the reason, I guess, I believe that's the reason they have been there for uh, so long. And non flowering plants such as mosses, ferns, fungi and algae produce, produce with the help of spores since they do not have flowers on do they make seeds. So it is important that you understand that spores are the, uh, are the structures uh, that carry the, the genetic material or the hereditary material of a non flowering plant and that's the, re that's the way. Uh, that they propagate the DNA and pass on their DNA to the next generation of plants. So, so they resemble seeds. This is also called asexual reproduction because this did not involve direct fertilization process and spores are reproductive cells of non-flowering plants uh, and they contain the genetic material of the plant inside a hard casing as I mentioned already. New plants grow from these spores under the right environmental conditions. Non flowering plants are generally hardier than flowering plants. So, this is also one of the reasons that they are also uh, well adapted to the environment because, by nature, by the, by the mother nature has chosen them, chosen for them that they be uh, hardier to the and, and, and strong. Um, and strong to the to the nature so they are able to resist more um, so that's why they have been able to survive harsh conditions and they are they have been virtually everywhere all around the globe and they have stayed there and, and keep and keep and have been there for a long time so uh, the flowering plants are also known as the angiosperms and they have existed for more than 130 million years more than 90 percent so most of the plant kingdom is composed of the flowering plants. So they are really important and they are, they are divided into monocots and dicots. So on the right side what you see is a diagram which compares the structure of a monocot, monocot to the dicot. So it has single cotyledon. So it's, it's, if you split its seeds you, you will observe this sort of a structure. It has a single cotyledon and then two cotyledons of dicot that's that's why it's called dicot so long narrow leaf parallel veins if you are able to read this um, and then dicot has a broad leaf but which has network of veins it the, the third point is very important to understand that it has vascular bundles which are scattered so all around its tissues uh, the vascular bundles inside a plant of monocot are scattered uh, on the mean, uh, on the other hand, the vascular bundles are arranged in a ring. In case of a dicot, um, in case of a dicot, floral plants are in multiples of four or five, while in dicot they are f in multiples of three. It's also so. These are a uh, bunch of points that differentiate one monocot plant from a dicot plant. And you see uh, on on the on the upside is a cot cotton plant, is a cotton plant, is a. Um, a white colored cotton plant what you see so uh, you're really not able to you re really not are responsible for uh, learning these differences but this is just an extra bit of knowledge that i, I really wanted to make clear um, flowers are the reproductive organs of all plants that distinguish flowering plants from seed plants or the gymnosperms that we just saw uh, so it has stamen which is the male reproductive part um, and then which is full of pollen. So pollen is the, the, the male sort of gamete that is able to be passed on or it's important for the fertilization. Flowering plants uh, bear one or several seeds enclosed in a fruit. So fruit body uh, encloses the seeds. Um, this fructification characteristic distinguishes angiosperms from gymnosperms. So it's a very important point that you understand that it has fruits which contains seeds as well. In case of non-flowering plants, there were spores. Um, they are comprised of the largest majority of plants that bear seeds. Each plant variety of angiosperms features a different size um, and shaped fruit which helps identify and classify the particular species. These fruits are available in a wide variety of colors and liven up the liven up this landscape during the growing season. So these are just uh, aesthetic features or aesthetic so they add to the aesthetic beauty as of the world as well. Definitely they do. 
so what you have to understand is that there are two sorts of flowering plants that are monocots one is a monocot and the other is dicot um, and then they have seeds which are the which are not present in, in, in a non flowering uh, plant and they are enclosed in a fruit and uh, the fruit size uh, is of uh, different sort which allows it to classify um, and categorize into different categories for the sci for for and makes it easier for the researchers as well and uh, now finally we are move uh, we've come to the last part of the of today's lecture which deals with the virus so virus I, I'll tell you um, really uh, viruses are really the infectious agents we have in picture that viruses are really dangerous because um, that's what we are told but uh, viruses also have a certain peculiar and interesting um, features that 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 might interest you as well so they are both living and non living how come so they because that's because they share uh, features of living organisms as well uh, as well as non living feature non living organisms so remember we talked that a living organism is one that can reproduce itself re reproduce on its own or reproduce with the like ones however what turns out that viruses cannot reproduce they can only reproduce when they are inside living cells be and that's because they they lack um, cellular organelles that we studied the various important structures are such as the cytoplasm and nucleus alone because they facilitate the process of transcription process of translation I remember i told you about the central dogma of molecular biology without that no propagation of um, genetic material or dna can happen that's why they uh, as soon as they get injected into a living organism or a living cell they hijack the cellular machinery of that living organism and utilize it um, or exploit it rather to say to make its own copies and reproduce and that and that only that point it can reproduce so living or so it shares both the characteristics of a living as well as a non living organism and they can infect virtually all sorts of living organisms from microorganisms to plants to animals um as i told you they lack uh, metabolic machinery of their own and are totally dependent on their host cell for replication as i told you that they do not have cell uh, cytoplasm and nucleus as well they cannot propagate their own dna on their own so they hijack hijack would be the right word because they take over the over the cellular machinery of the host of the host body or or, or any organism that they attack or they get into uh, they contain nucleic acid which is their hereditary material they have dna or rna but not both so a virus can have a dna and or are an and it has a protein core so it is very important that you understand these two components are contained within every sort of virus so a virus can have a dna or an rna so rna is ribonucleic acid dna is di deoxyribonucleic acid which with its own characteristics will i guess we'll learn more about uh, these two molecules as well in in our um, coming lectures as well so which in cases the nucleic acid some viruses are in also enclosed by an envelope of fat and protein molecules it is in its infective form outside the cell a virus is quite a virus particle is called a virion so outside the cell um, it also maintains its ability to infect um, and but then it's called a virion so this picture is what shows the 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 diagram of a bacteriophage which is a virus which is a very common virus of bacteria uh, it has protein code uh, uh, on the outer side you see that this label diagram this beautifully label diagram demonstrates that it has a protein code the outer coat outermost boundary then it has this blue ring like uh, coil like i guess structure this one it is the nucleic acid um and in this case it's dna in the case of this influenza virus so it's the virus of animals of, and it has also infected humans as well rna in case of influenza it's rna in case of bacteriophage it's dna then it has tails the bacteriophage has tails and fibers uh, membrane envelope is present on the influenza so you see that 
two things are really common a uh, protein coat protein coat plus uh, dna or rna these two features are really important for a virus uh, to be a virus so to say but it lacks a uh, nucleus so you see there is no nucleus you see there is no uh, uh, cytoplasm there is no other uh, golgi body or mitochondria or any other uh, basic cellular substructure that we learned of so the uh, every sort of virus lacks this it's really 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 a small um, organism which is both a living plus non living so this is the pe peculiar characteristic of a virus so it has dna or rna as its hereditary material it has a protein coat which infects its dna so what happens is i'll tell you what one interesting uh, concept of uh, mechanism how bacteriophage attacks a bacteria so it it uh, it happens that um it firmly grips the structure of a bacteria so 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 for example this is a bacteria and then it will come and hold this bacteria and it will uh, then so for example this is uh its dna this is a bacteriophage and then it will um bind onto its surface and it inject its dna into this bacterial cell and then once inside the bacteria it will uh, make copies by the pre by 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 utilizing bacteria's um or bacteriums or a bacterium sorry uh, um cellular machinery so this was a virus which attacked it has protein coat and then it has a dna as soon as it gets inside the bacteria um the it takes over this um machinery of bacteria to allow uh, to to exploit it rather to say to make its own copies and that's the way how viruses uh, propagate um but you can also learn more about viruses because there are also other families of viruses um, so you can see um that it's interesting to learn of them um i hope that you enjoyed this lecture um i'll uh, i guess my camera has gone down um i'm sorry about that really uh, i'll sort that out as well uh, but till then uh, till next time take care and uh, let me know what you think of this lecture and i hope that i have done a fair job uh, thank you so much i'll be waiting for your feedback as well till then take care and goodbye from my side